very excited to introduce this next member. He almost didn't make it, <laughs> but in true fashion style, we've got Samuel Rizzo. <laughs> but you probably haven't seen me at all throughout today because I've just come off an airplane. So I think to start this presentation, I should you know, let you know a bit about me. I'm Samuel, I'm from Darwin. I'm 18, I'm a, I'm a Libra. The rest of you are men. That's not me, even though he's a dashing man. That's not me or anyone I'm related to, in fact. That is actually Harry Harlan. Does anyone know who he is? Show of hands if you do. Okay, he is an American psychologist. So he's looked at great things like evolution theory, etc. But towards the mid 80s, he looked at something which was a big epidemic plaguing America. There was something that was the fourth biggest cause in breakups in marriage, you know, basic relationships, and that is indecision. So who's indecisive here? Let's show up hands. Who's indecisive? Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there's not, there's not your hand up either. I'm just going to assume you're too indecisive about whether you're indecisive. So to a degree, we're all indecisive, but so am I. Me to a great extent, but I've got a pretty peculiar form of indecision. I get really hungry, right? But I don't know what to eat. <laughs> now that's a really bad combo because that leads to one thing, being hangry. Now being hangry is a bit of a slang millennial term. And what it means from the Urban Dictionary right here is just basically being in a state of so much hunger that you're angry and frustrated, right? And me, when I'm upset and a bit moody, it's not fun for anyone. So I came on the plane, right? They came up to me and they said, do you want the eggs or do you want the noodles? And I said, I don't know which one I want. And they ended up just leaving because I was getting a huge backlog of people, so they decided to leave, and I did not eat. So I haven't eaten since 5 a.m., and you know, I'm about two sentences away from being hangry. So that is why today I thought, you know what? I'm gonna use my mate, Harry Harlow, to do something that he proposed back in the 80s. He said, when you're indecisive, what you should do is get a focus group together, like you guys here, and you should get them to vote on what you should do, because it removes completely your of subjective you know, factors in what you should do, and what they decide you should do. So that's why I decided to get two pieces of food up here, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna put it to a vote. Now something to note about me is that I'm a proud Greek, right? And everyone keeps saying that because of that, my food choices are a bit too narrow, I need to expand them more. But I think that's utter rubbish, but you can make that decision for yourself. So the choices today are either a lamb or, or a chicken viewer. So before we get into this vote, I'm going to call up two people. Can I please have Hayden and Emily up to the front for me, please? And what they're going to do, they're going to act like my little vote counters because I'm not in any frame of mind. You know, I'm angry, remember, I can't count. So I'll get you on that side, Emily. Hayden, you on that side. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go three, two, one, vote. And this is how you're going to vote for either the lamb or the chicken euros. If you want me to eat the lamb euros after this, I want you to put your right hand up and make a little open palm like that. If you want me to eat the chicken euros, then with your left hand, raise that up and make a little fist. So we have to count and our I'll get you, Emily, you count the right hand with the palm open because that's the lamb euros. So yeah. our left. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, right. yeah, 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 yeah. So the open palm, right? Okay, yep. And you're going to count the opposite, the knuckles, right? So on the count of three, you're going to all vote for me and then we'll count that up and we'll see how we go. So three, two, one, vote. And this is a compulsory vote. There's a fine of buying me a euros after if you do not vote. Ah, so it's looking like a pretty, hmm, this is a really interesting vote. We're seeing a pretty clear bias towards the one side, but I'll wait for the final numbers to come in with these purple counters, but it's really looking like it's gonna go Look, I think I missed a couple people. Okay, but don't worry, if you don't get it completely accurate, that's fine. Have you got a final number? Yeah. Have you got a final number? Okay, so. so how many people want me to eat the lamb euros? 19. Actually, keep your hands up, please, as well. Oh. I've got to mention that. So keep them up for the whole time. 19. 19, and how many? Nine. Okay, so there's a, that fits about. Keep them up still. We gotta keep them up, but you know what? Something's not feeling right about this. This isn't quite realistic right now. You know what? I'm gonna say, Adam, mm. you strike me as someone who wouldn't really care about what I eat, so I don't think you're even going to enroll to vote. So you know what? Put your hand down for me. I'll get you two to put your hands down for me. Fletch, put your hand down. Get you two to put your hand down. So, okay, that's a bit better. I think this is a bit more realistic. No, it's still not enough. You know what? Actually, I think I'm gonna say, can you, sir, please put your hand down? You and Kat, please put your hand down. Brianna, please put your hand down. I think, all right, I think we're finally, no, one more. I think just one more. Okay, you please put your hand down. You please put your hand down, your hand down. And you two put your hand down. Okay, so, all right. Can you please count them again now on each side? Eight. Wow, so how did we just go suddenly from having the lamb murals dominating to getting equal? You know what, I think, well, 
For an indecisive man, you've just locked up my two things. My whole thought experiment has just failed. But you know what? You're all waiting for the big what this means. I'm telling you, there, there is no big extended metaphor. I'm just that hungry that I could not decide no. What we just simulated there was a 2016 Northern Territory election. So, after, <laughs> so, so we had about 30 odd of you in the room. And by the time we ended it, we only had about just over half of you voting. And that's really evocative of the empty election where we only had 58%, you two can go sit down. No, we only had 58% of eligible voters actually voting, right? So if we look at this here, this was an NT News article, the start of the year, which showed a really shocking statistic. That showed us that there are 25,000 people in the Northern Territory that are eligible to vote, but are not enrolled. So what did this look like in the 2016 election? It meant that one in six eligible Territorians were not enrolled to vote. It meant that secondly, one in four eligible territories did not even cast a ballot. So they didn't even go to the vote. Even if they were enrolled, they just didn't even care to go. But it also then meant that only 58% of eligible territories actually voted. So that's a fairly like frivolous example of what I gave you voting about your losses. But if we were to put that into the context of politics, right? People that are making great decisions about our lives, we've suddenly gone from a large majority of lamb losses to a small majority. Why? Because we've just forfeited the ideas, perspectives, and views of about 42% of you. And <coughs> even if we miss one person, that's one too many in my books personally. Because everyone has a different perspective, a different opinion, but most importantly, we uphold democracy, right? I'm a proud Greek man again. <laughs> I love my democracy. And this is posing a really significant threat to us. But that's why today, I'm going to talk about youth engagement in politics. Now you're probably all wondering right now, Sam, there's a bit of a discrepancy there. You're talking about youth specifically but we're looking at the general population with that last statistic. But this is why I think we have a particular issue with youths. So in 2017, what we had was a same-sex marriage postal plebiscite. Hands up if you voted in that. I don't care what you voted, but just if you voted. Right, so we had a pretty good, and those are the, I know that the uh, round table members can't put your hand up, but we have a pretty good turnout, you guys voted. But if we're looking at, oh, this is also the definition of youth engagement, just so you know what we're talking about. We're looking at like, what's your likelihood to either vote all the way to just going up to your local member and talking about either a pressing issue that you have. In some regard, are you willing to acknowledge that there's like an issue in your community and are you going to talk about these issues? Much like we're doing today. Like I can scorchly say that these beautiful people in the back are politically engaged because they're talking about taboo issues. They're talking about big issues. But going back to this 2017 plebiscite, if we're looking at the election of Solomon, so that's just the urban areas, even this half of Zucoli is not even in Solomon anymore. We can see that on average, only about 58% of the eligible youths in the Northern Territory voted. But if we compare that to somewhere like Kuyong, that number drastically soars up. And on average, 82% of youths in the rest of Australia voted on that plebiscite. So clearly we have a big discrepancy in the NT. But this even goes on to a large issue because we can you know, push this under the rug enough and say, kids not engaging in politics is fine. They'll get into it when they're older. But as we're seeing now, that train isn't continuing. And I have a bit of a hypothesis why. If you were to wind back the clocks a few years to perhaps when our older members in the audience were a bit younger, you didn't have technology, etc. You had only a few main mediums of information, perhaps a newspaper and the nightly news. But you couldn't actively choose what to subscribe to. If you look at myself today, I can pick out my phone and I can actively choose to just read about the football or read about something else. Making news online has made it so much easier for me to actively choose what I want. And as a youth, am I going to care about politics? No. Why? Because as a society, we're telling me that I'm too young to understand it. I don't need to worry about it as of now. So I thought, all right, we have an issue here, but I want to try to figure out how big is this issue. So I go to Darwin High School here and I thought, all right, I'll run a survey of these kids, a quick one, just to see, you know, how bad is it? It could not be bad, maybe just some kids in the NT didn't want to go vote in the purpose. That's fine. But what we had was less than a third of them understood how a law is made. So they didn't even understand why they had to come to school, because that's a law, right? You go to school legally, but they didn't even understand why they had to do that. We then had seven in ten of them on a ten-point scale ranked, ranked their engagement in politics as a three or lower. And five out of ten ranked it as a zero. So half of Darwin High School does not believe that they're engaged politically at all. We also had only one in 30 knew the name of their chief minister. Now you may think, look, that's a pretty frivolous statement, right? Who cares? If you don't know the name of your chief minister, that's fine. And that's not conducive to being politically engaged. You don't have to know your chief minister's name to be able to talk about issues. It's rather evocative of the current state of youth engagement in the Northern Territory. 
So why was this? I asked this question to these kids as well. Why did you answer that your engagement was this, etc.? So we had number one. This was the most prominent response with 70% of kids. The idea of politics was daunting. And that's fair, right? If I were to say to you there's this random body called the NT Legislative Assembly that makes decisions for you, you're going to think, oh, hold up. I don't, I don't understand that. What's that meant to mean to me? But number two, they didn't have a reason to care. I'm not able to vote, so why should I care about politics, right? Because that's that logical connection that if you can't actually in that change in the ballot box, why do you need to care? But then we had number three, they knew nothing about it. And this is the point that I want to touch on the most today. Because I'm a staunch believer that knowing about politics and knowing about your issues and knowing about how to engage is how we actually increase that. And that's for this simple reason. The fallacy has always been that kids do not want to engage in politics. They do. Because who doesn't want to engage on a fundamental level with issues in their community? We see these kids at the back here wanting to engage. We see that they disprove this statement right now because they're here today giving up a Sunday to come give us talks about issues ranging from toilets to sexual health. We see things like the climate strikes. We are now seeing kids are finding their own avenues to express themselves politically. But we can do more to actually open that door for them. And this is why I now say, what can we actually do about it? So this is our two-prong approach and ways that we can go about it. The first one that I want to draw note to is programs such as these two up here, the YMCA Youth Parliament and UN Youth Australia and Northern Territory. These two programs, while they're not specifically might not tell you how a law is made, they're going to start that fire within you. They're going to give you the skills to acknowledge the fact that you can engage politically. They're going to give you the skills to know that it's not a grown-up sport. It's not just an arena for people over the age of 30 or who can vote. And I know that today, you and Youth Northern Territory is getting bigger than ever, and they're reaching more kids every week. And we see that you and Youth Parliament, um, for I mean the YMCA Youth Parliament, it's actually coming back next year. So we're seeing inroads in that. This is the second part that I think really needs to be looked at. So when John Howard was in government, he instigated a policy. He knew that this would happen one day, so he said, "All right, we're going to put civics and citizenship classes in school." But you know what that program looked like? It looked like telling a person in grade six who a shadow minister was. Now that's like telling me what a dad joke is. I just don't get it. Because <laughs> if it, if it, you come to an older age, you're not, you're not going to retain that information. It goes through one ear and out the other. And by the time you reach year 10, when you're actually starting to vote, the curriculum's done. They expect you to learn it going up from year four to year six, but that's not enough. That's why I'd like to end this presentation with a short little story. So back in year 11, I took a legal studies class. Now that's probably the most misleading class title ever because I thought we were gonna learn about the law, et cetera. No, it's a civics and citizenships class. We learned about the government, etc. When we started that class, the teacher gave us a little pop quiz to you know, grasp our knowledge. She said three main questions. One, who is the prime minister of Australia? Two kids knew. Who is the chief minister of the Northern Territory? The most common answer was Adam Giles, even though Mark Brown has been <laughs> in government for about three years. And the third thing, perhaps the most shocking to me personally, what is government? Mm. Silence. And it wasn't one of, the, one of those things where they couldn't articulate it, they just didn't even know. Mm. What was this mysterious body, this blanket of ambiguity that makes decisions that I have to abide by? Mm. But here's the funny thing, there is a bit of hope to the story. So I'm not, I'll be telling them a pessimist, but I'm going to end this on a high. <laughs> by the end of that class, it was a one semester class, which is 20 weeks. By the end of that, I had kids who had no idea who the, the chief minister was mm -hmm. telling me how a law went from the legislative assembly all the way to being ratified by, <coughs> um, you know, by being ratified by, I forget the name. Yeah, that's right, that's right. And I just thought, that's amazing. To go from not knowing the name of your chief minister to being able to understand how a law is ratified in 20 weeks, what does that show? And I asked her, I said, why? Why do, you, why do you think that you just suddenly understood in 20 weeks all this? And she said, Sam, it's not that I never did not want to understand. I wanted to understand it. I just wasn't shown how to. Mm -hmm. I think that's the key thing I want to leave with everyone today. Mm -hmm. As a youth standing here today, I want to talk about these issues because they affect me too. Mm -hmm. It's not that I'm going to wait until I'm 18. I'm going to assume that something's going to take over. My life will be okay. I want to talk about these issues now. And so do these people here. But we are not given the skills to do that. And it looks like showing kids the avenues of expressing their opinion. But even from that, it's showing them how these mechanisms even work. Because how can you engage with something if you don't know how it even works? 
So to fire finish this off, we do not want to breed a silent generation. But with education and showing kids the way, we don't have to. And we can change the narrative of what we've seen and we can change the perspective of the youths of the Northern Territory. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>